Is everybody in here? Does anyone know if everyone's in here or no? Who is, let me put it this way, who is missing whoever they came here with today? No? Okay. Well, I was given the instructions to begin. No introduction, so I'll give it to myself. I'm Andy McCabe. I'm with Clinton Delegates. I do uh, independent estimating for general contractors in the restoration field. Um, so, welcome to the OCAA Symposium 2013. I'm glad you guys could come. I'm glad you guys sat on the same side of the room as my projector. Thank you for not sitting over there. <laughs> I don't know what's going on over there. I was sitting, uh, sitting by myself earlier today trying to collect my thoughts. How many people have heard, heard, the, uh, heard the saying that if you're nervous giving a talk, you should envision your audience naked? How many people? It's not naked. It, it's, it's not working for me. I'm just, I'm seeing a bunch of naked dudes, so I've got to sh shake this off here and keep going. <laughs> I'm here today to talk about social media. Uh, we live in a world uh, that's ever changing and ever evolving and it happens faster and faster every day and there's a lot of buzzwords a lot of a lot of different things out there that we we all consider social media I'm here to dispel some of the myths give you some insights and break things down for you in a way that it should make sense and if it doesn't make sense there's a Q&A after this so we'll all make it sense make sense after that I'd like to start with a couple quotes I'm trying to decide which side of this to stand on, so I'm sorry. Uh, what happens when people open their hearts? They get better. We are human beings, and we're put on this earth to interact with each other. And we get better when we open our hearts to each other, when we're able to learn from each other. And it seems counterintuitive, but when we make ourselves vulnerable, when we expose ourselves to each other, it actually gives us power. It makes us more powerful and has more influence. So that is the basic premise of all social media. Social media is not doing anything new. It's doing the same thing that we've done for millennia in a new way. We're all about interacting. We're all about making connections. We're all about exposing our, ourselves to each other in the hopes that we're going to be received uh, in the hopes that that visibility and that exposure is going to be reciprocated back to us so we can grow together. So, and I was, all, I was also given instructions to get this over by 2.45, so whoever is looking at their clock, and when it gets five minutes to 2.45, just raise your hand. Hey, dude, get off the stage, man. We're going to go have some drinks. Let's get this over with. All right. Who here has seen the movie Far and Away? Nicole Kidman in some short good-looking guy. Who was that? Tom Cruise? Okay. Every movie about the turn of the century, Mary Poppins even, it shows a picture like this. The cities of the, the turn of the century were, were gorgeous and quaint. Uh, even the street urchins were, were quaint in their own way because they could sing and dance. Um, and it was all pretty. Everyone wore their top hats everywhere and everyone, every gentleman nodded and everyone, every lady was in a dress. But the reality was that cities of 1890 to 1920 were hell. They were hell because everything that got to a city, the food, the people, the products, came in on a horse. Everything that left a city had to have a horse pull it out. In 1893, there were 20,000 people a day, or I'm sorry, 20,000 people a year dying from diseases caused by horse manure. There were 16 people a day dying in New York City from traffic accidents. That's the problem when you have a car that has an engine with a mind of its own. The tragic economy of, of horses and the sheer number of horses meant that it was cheaper for people to work a horse to death, unhook it, leave it in the street, and go get a new team of horses than it was to go find a stable somewhere and change out their team of horses. And unlike the picture I had up just a moment ago, this was a more realistic picture of a street in New York City. 
What, could you imagine leaving your car parked for a week and coming back and it's buried in shit? <laughs> but that's hap that was happening. Even the architecture, I'll mention the architecture in a second. Who can do the math for me real quick? Every horse on average dumped 35 pounds of waste a day. If there were 500,000 horses in the city of New York, how much dung was that? A lot. That's a scientific term? A lot. Well, there's a, there's a crap load, and then there's a shit ton. These, I think these all came from early 1900 New York City. Even the architecture of the time was <clears throat> excuse me, influenced by the fact that these, we had piles and piles of horse manure stacking up all over the place. We think it's because uh, they had servants and, and cooks and stuff that used a lower level, and, the, and the, uh, the people of the house needed to use an upper level. But no, the reality was you needed a staircase to go from the street to the second floor to get through the piles that were piling up in New York City. It got so bad, people were dying, people were frustrated. In 1893, the world's first, uh, uh, first city planning uh, urban, you can read it better than I can say it, Ur International Urban Planning Convention was slated to last 10 days. It ended in three days. And they weren't talking about anything except what to do about the horses. New York City was capped at a million and a half people because physically, technically, they could not get the poop out fast enough to sustain any more people. And then something really weird happened. What, something that all the brains in the world that came to New York City in 1893 for that convention couldn't figure out. It's something that had been invented 20 years earlier, is the automobile. And all of a sudden, all these problems and all these, these things, the, the tantamount problem of the time evaporated into nothing. So by 1927, Henry Ford had the pleasure of watching his 15, 15th millionth Model T roll off the line. In 1900, there were over 1,000 different automobile manufacturers. And then in 1920, for the first time in human history, more people lived in cities than they did in urban or, uh, in the, on farms, in rural environments. So this solution came out of nowhere. People, no one saw it coming. And it changed everything. The automobile gave us strip malls. The automobile gave us all the things that we take for granted today. But the people that were making wagon wheels, the people that were making, uh, making hay, growing hay, the entire economy had to make a shift and people were left behind. People were caught off guard by it. What I read when I was putting this thing together um, is this concept of the arrogance of the present. It, may, it says that we can't recognize the future potential of a given technology because we have a present mindset. People couldn't see the potential use of a car. They thought the car was just this fad. It's not going to last. We've always had horses. We're going to have horses for the until the end of time. This car thing, it'll never, it'll never catch on. So we move past the Industrial Revolution. Now we're into the information age. And things are just getting faster. The Apple IIe, 1975. 73, 75. Who, can, who, who recognizes this game right here? What is it? Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail. How many hours did we spend in grade school or middle school? I don't know how to date anyone in this room. Or high school. OK, who was in high school playing Oregon Trail? <laughs> From the invention of the steam engine, it took us 98 years to get to the automobile. From the invention of the first integrated circuit, it only took us 15 years to get the first personal computer. Our technology is increasing in speed, and it's changing everything ever faster. This chart points out the difference between uh, the time that, that uh, it takes for technology to reach a quarter of the population. Electricity was invented or brought to, brought to the public in 1873, but it took 46 years after the invention of electricity for a quarter of the United States population to adopt electricity. Fast forward to 1991, when Al Gore evidently came up with it, 
World Wide Web only took seven years for a quarter of the United States population to adopt it. Technology has just sped everything up. Who's familiar with Moore's Law? One person, I mean, what is, what is Moore's Law in a nutshell? Exactly right. And you can read. The potential computing power that we have in technology essentially doubles every two years. And since the invention of Moore's Law, that number has been revised to 18 months. Meaning, I bought this computer last fall. 18 months from, so next December, next January, I'll be able to go out and spend the same amount of money to get a computer that runs twice as fast. That rate has been going since the invention of the integrated circuit. And what it's doing is speeding the extinction of things that we thought were, we, we could take for granted. I, if you do a search on the internet for things that used to be <laughs> but are no longer, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. And I, I picked out my favorite ones. What is, this, what is this black thing in the middle here? Who recognizes what that is? I had one. It's an answering machine. What is that? You mean you don't have it on your phone? We all had answering machines. We all saw an answering machine is, is, is an example of a technology that was invented, came to its, its heyday in my lifetime, and is gone in my lifetime, less than my lifetime. 20 years, answering machine was here, answering machine is gone. Pay phones, encyclopedia. When was the last time anyone went to the library to look anything up? I remember when I had, the only source of information I had was a library. Everything is changing. I want to talk about borders and blockbuster. Block, I was a Hollywood video guy. I was a diehard Hollywood video guy. And then I got these late charges. And then I, oh, I'll, I'll try blockbuster because I don't want to pay these $20 in late fees. I had no idea, and none of us had any idea, that in 15 years, blockbuster wouldn't exist. Now, Blockbuster, here's a huge company that has all, every advantage of the modern world. They have marketing people. They have research people. They have, they have everything at their hands. And they didn't see the internet coming. They didn't see Netflix coming. Even when Netflix came out, ah, it's just a fad. That's just a fad. And that won't catch on. People want to go down and pick out their videos. Same thing with Borders. Border, why didn't Borders see Amazon coming? Amazon wasn't invented overnight. Amazon was selling other things before they were selling books. But the World Wide Web and the technology that's come out of it has just destroyed and decimated the economy as we know it. And what we have is a lot of people who are experts in their field, but their field doesn't exist anymore. It's mind-blowing. I read it. I recommend this book highly, Free Agent Nation. And what Free Agent Nation says is we are moving from an economy where we we'll go and work for a company, and we're, all, we're moving towards an economy where we're all working for ourselves, we're interacting with multiple different clients, and we're pooling all our talents to come up with this free agent nation. We're all going to be free agents. There's not going to be any one employer. There's going to be, you're going to be your own employer. But among one of the great quotes in here. One of them is, your network is going to be your safety net. And that stuck out to me because I'm talking about social media, I'm talking about networking. And in the world that we're about to enter, our networks are going to be our security blankets. Our networks are what, our networks of people that we know, people that we're associated with, are going to be people that are going to be there when we need them, not a, a 401k or not a a retirement plan that's going to evaporate overnight. I also found out, I was happy to learn, that I am an expert in my field. You know why? Because it takes 10,000 hours of doing something, and you're considered an expert. That's one definition. It just happens to be a definition that I like, because I've been doing what I've been doing for almost 13 years. So I'm an expert in what I do. How many people are experts 
according to that definition in what they do. That's it? I spent a Morphe to raise their hands. Where's the RGL folks? I can't see that far. Oh, they're in there. I can't pick it anybody. All right, I'll pick on somebody else. Who's an accountant in the room? Okay. Uh, Keep many of them left. What? Uh, oh, perfect. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to set you up with this question just so you know. But, okay, your name and who you work for? Gregson Parker, and I, I'm a free agent. I work for myself. You do? And you're a forensic accountant. So you know numbers pretty good. What? You know numbers. I know people. You know people. That's the difference between accounting and forensic accounting. But you work with numbers. Okay. Just roll with it. Just roll with it. <laughs> Your name? Rick Sutton. Rick Sutton? And with who? Scribner, Scribner, Sutton, the CPA for McDonald's. Okay. Oh, CPA. I'm going to pick on you, Rick. <laughs> I got a question for you. If I had 37 pieces of bacon and I ate 21 of them, what would I have? <laughs> Who saw that Facebook post? How many, the answer is, and I, I, I admit I set you up, it's not a number, it's a thing that I have. I have greasy fingers, I have salty lips, I have a full belly, and I have happiness. Because I love bacon. The point I'm trying to make is it's not what we do that makes us happy. It's not what we're experts at. It's not what we do all day for jobs. It's, it, that's not the point. The point of everything is, is why. Why are we here? We're here to be happy. We're here to make each other happy. We're here to get to know the people in our spheres. And that's what produces happiness and bacon. I mean, bacon is, oh, bacon. It comes down to human needs. We don't need jobs. We don't need to be accountants. We don't need to be construction estimators. What we need as humans, we need companionship, close contact. We need to be loved. We need to be received for who we are. We need acceptance and we need to be seen. Maslow has came up a long time ago with this hierarchy of needs. And if you're not familiar with the hierarchy of needs, it starts on the very basic level, food, shelter heat. And you go up from there. You need security, security of employment, security of resources. And up and up and up until, until you reach self-actualization. I found a great chart here that inserted social media into Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it was very interesting. I'm here to talk about LinkedIn today, in case you didn't know that. LinkedIn solves one of our needs, and it's one of our most basic needs, it's our need of security. It's our need of, need of employment so we can provide security for ourselves and for our families. Last year, I think it was February or March, after starting in 2004, Facebook reached its one billionth active user. Now, Mark Zuckerberg didn't set out to get a billion people to use his network. And one of the, my favorite quotes of his, someone asked him what his thoughts were on one billion users of Facebook, and he says, what this points out is it, people do not have a fundamental need to use Facebook, but people do have a fundamental need to connect. Zuckerberg just made a platform. We made it what it is today. We made it our own and took it into our own homes and we created Facebook. Facebook was going to happen whether Mark Zuckerberg invented it or not. We needed a way to connect. And once that technology got here, it took off like wildfire. I'm arguing that we are no longer in the information age. We've entered a different age. And I'm not going to try to name it. I, I came up with a name, the age of connection. I, if it takes off, then I get the full credit. But I'm sure someone already thought of it. We are in an age where 
We are so interconnected like never before. There are things that can happen within our network that aren't even connected to us that affect us in profound ways. And it's creating a way for us to look at the same world we've been living in in a completely new light. This picture here is from data gleaned from Flickr. Flickr is a photo uploading site. And this person put together a picture of local photographers versus tourists. So the, in this picture, the red dots and lines are tourists and their photos, and the blue dots and lines are locals and their photos. Who can tell me what this, which city this is? Whoa! How'd you know that? Paramedic there for nine years. Oh, well, insider knowledge. Okay, so what's this red dot uh, up above? That's Alcatraz. Alcatraz, yep. Alcatraz and the Golden Gate Bridge is that line. I use this to show that we are seeing the same world in an entirely new light. And just like in 1900 where there were a thousand different automobile manufacturers, there's greater, there's probably more than a thousand different social networks out there. I'd like to give a little story. How am I doing on time? All right, I'll tell two stories. I'll skip, I'll skip the third one. We are interacting with each other. We're interacting with companies in a profoundly different way. I've seen this in, you know, I, I grew up in this. In 1993, Netscape came out with their first web browser, and I was a senior in high school. The technology now today is, we could not even imagine it. So, I know I'm giving this presentation. I know that video marketing is huge and I'm about self-promotion, so I know I want to record this video. And I see online, actually, I got referred online to a site of these guys. I said, I want a camera that will follow me around and record my voice so I can put my presentation on YouTube. And I found this thing. It's cool, I don't know if you've noticed it, but it's following me around wherever I, wherever I go. So I go, I had a question. This thing was built for an iPhone. I don't have an iPhone. So I went on, what did I do? I went to their Facebook page and I said, hey dudes, I've got this camera. Can I use this camera with, with, uh, with your device? And will your device, uh, will I be able to hear the motor of your device when it moves around? And what'd they say? I said, I'm gonna use this uh, C920. I can't, uh, I can't tell, is there an audio out? I was, I was trying to figure out how to do this. And what they do, they said, email me, we got an idea for you. I got an email from this dude in the middle, uh, Vladimir, I don't I forget his last name. He is the founder and designer of this product. This product's been on the, the market for a year and a half. I went on to Facebook and got right to him. Now I'm a beta tester for new software that he installed on this machine that he sent to me himself. That is a way that we interact with our brands in our lost my train there. How, could we have done that 10 years ago? Could we have gone to, when was the last time you had a problem with your Sony Walkman? Who had a Walkman? Who had a Walkman? Ah. If that thing broke, could you, could you email Sony? Hey man, I got this problem with the headphone jack. Would you get a response? Ever? No, they're too big. What social networking and, and social media has done is brought us, there used to be this gap between us and this manufacturer, and now it just, it's, it's not there. It's just not there. So I had success with Facebook once, so last week I went to get beer. Who likes beer? Liars, you all like beer. <laughs> just don't wanna say. Uh, I love beer. Thank you. <laughs> We, get, we share that love, by the way, and you know this. So I go to this beer store, I fill up two growlers full of beer, and one of them's a stainless steel growler, one's a glass growler, so they're gonna weigh differently. When I take them off the shelf and I take them home, one feels lighter, well, what do you know? I get home and it's half full of foam. And do I pick up the phone? Do I drive back down to the store? No, I go to their Facebook page and, hey, dude, you owe me a beer. And what they say, no problem, man, sorry. Next time you come in, ask for your free beer. That just wouldn't have happened in the world of yesterday. 
I've got to tell the story. I can't skip it. So leading up to this presentation, I asked the board of OCAA, we should have a LinkedIn page. We should, we should do LinkedIn because not only am I giving a presentation on LinkedIn, but it's really where it's at. We need to be there. And Spunky Gray, bless her heart, had reservations. She sent me an email back. I'm not sure if it's a good fit. I'm not comfortable. And I said, I appreciate that. Come to the presentation. We'll talk about it. And hopefully after the presentation, you'll, we'll have a different understanding of what LinkedIn is how, and how OCAA can take advantage of it. And then she sends me an email a few minutes later. Oh, on the way to work today, I heard this email, or I heard this, this story about Twitter. And now NPR is doing all their hiring off of Twitter resumes. And I said, what? No way. What kind, of, what kind of read can you get on a person in 140 characters? And for those of you that don't know what Twitter is, it's this. You've got 140 characters that you send out to the world. In my world, happens to have, I have two followers, and one of them's me. <laughs> and it just, just words go out there. I'm not going to try to reread those. I put those up for comic relief. But I do know I found this resume. This is an actual resume. Someone wants to get a job by sending this out. I'm in your way, all right. I'm moving to Atlanta. I want to get hired. Here's my skills. I don't think this is where it's going to go. Maybe I have a little bit of that uh, arrogance of the present going on, but I don't get it. I still don't get it. Because this is a resume. This is a LinkedIn resume. This is my resume, and I'm not here to promote myself. I'm here to illustrate what a good resume is, just to be clear. Because what's the point of a resume? What's the point of, of this type of interaction? It's to find a job. What are people looking for when they're looking at resumes? You know, if this is a resume, what does this, what does this say? What type of person is this? Well, you don't know. You know what, where they worked. You know what their skill set is, what they say their skill set is. You don't know what type of person that is. Is this the type of person you would leave your kids with to watch for the night? You have no idea. What LinkedIn has done, and what I'm here to talk about, is bring that quality of knowing someone a little bit deeper. It's gone beyond the paper resume. LinkedIn is a living resume. And I, when was the last time you had a paper resume? Oh, that you were able to click on. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Where is it? Here it is. Come on. Oh, please, really? <laughs> really? The point of a resume is to get a feeling for the type of person that you're trying to hire. By the way, I'm gonna, when we're done here, I'm going to go get on my horse. We're going to take the wagon. Back. Okay. You need to be able to trust the person you're hiring with. Okay. How'd you know? Instead, we would ask people to start making real progress in the world. 
What was the last resume you read that said that? Um, I would argue you never have. Um, the point is, with the current technology, the way things are going, we have a way to connect on a level that we've never seen before with each other and with our potential employers. I'm on the wrong slide again. You're fired. Don't get this guy back, don't, don't back. ever. <laughs> so if you remember one thing today, I want you to remember this slide. This will get you through whatever social media conundrum you happen to be in. Connection leads to conversation, leads to relationships. Everything happens at the third level. Everything happens at the relationship level. Hiring, firing, purchase decisions, buying decisions. The level of trust you have in that relationship determines the level, how much influence you have. I'm not going to talk about G+, I'm not going to talk about Facebook. I'm going to skip past it. I'm going to talk about LinkedIn real quick. I already said it's a living resume. We have the capacity to leverage like no other time in history. I have 698 connections on LinkedIn. If I send a message to every, if I send a message to all 700 and they forward that message to their contacts, I'm going to reach 4.8 million people with a click of a button. Now the trick is getting them to forward that on, of course, but the power, the breadth of our networks we don't realize how much we can leverage those. So let's talk about, quickly, some bad things. No matter what you're doing, even if you're just answering emails, there's bad people out there. There's phishing schemes. There's, and there's people that want your private information. There's people that want to do bad things. And they are everywhere, and they're on the internet too. My advice is use your head. It, up here it says, follow your heart, but take your mind along. You know, don't turn that off just because you turn the computer on. A lot of people are concerned about privacy. Do I want all my information out there? And some people don't. If you don't want your information out there, fine. I would ask you, if you want a job, how many people do you want to see your resume? Does it hurt to have too many people see your resume? If it does, then don't make the choice. Don't go on LinkedIn. I would argue, as many people as possible should see your resume if you're looking for a job. I've been laid off three times in the last three years. The first two times I had jobs within three weeks because I used LinkedIn and I used email and I blasted that sucker out there. And both times I got hired was not from someone who I knew directly, it was from someone else who had heard from someone that I knew directly, hey, you should look this guy up. He's out there, you better snatch him up. Business and personal, keep them separate. Facebook is for personal. Facebook is for advertising your business if you have a business. Your Facebook is not for your resume. Facebook is not for interacting with your boss. Please don't do it. And if your grandma would be offended by reading it or seeing it, it probably shouldn't be out there. And then the last thing is time commitment. Some people have expressed, I don't have the time to do social media. Well, and it's true, you don't have the time unless you're going to go out hire someone to do it full time for you, like a lot of companies do. Kennedy Restoration, bless them, they are everywhere. They've got a G Plus page, a Facebook page, a LinkedIn page, a Twitter account, but they also have a full time employee to do it all. You're going to invest your time in what works for you, and if you're looking for a job, you're going to use LinkedIn. You're going to invest the time in front, up front, it's going to take some time. But once it's set up, all you have to do is go and update it every now and then. The key to LinkedIn, this is a quote from one of my favorite authors, Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. How many people have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Everyone else, go to Amazon, pick up Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and read that book. He said it's all insider trading. It's only illegal if you're too far inside. He's talking about trading on information, trading on relationships. If you know something that someone else doesn't, you have the advantage. And just because you take 
take advantage of that advantage, doesn't make it illegal or bad, you got the job and they didn't. This is, a, this is a graph that illustrates the fact that most jobs never make it to the public. There's a hidden, hidden job market where if they're not going to hire from internally or if they don't find, know somebody, then they're going to search for a resume and look, look for somebody or they're going to post a job. The vast majority of people that get jobs, that job was never publicized to the public. And they, people use their networks, the people that they knew, they had a job opening at their company and they say, hey, I got the guy. I know the girl. This girl is a magician at what she does. We should hire her. And what this graph also says is most people that got jobs weren't looking for jobs. They were sought out and they were looked for. How are we doing on time here? In the back of your booklet, you should have these 10 steps. The very back, you guys got it? So I'm not gonna go through them, but I wanna touch on the last one, but I'm not gonna touch on it right now. First thing you need to do is use your account. It makes no sense. That's one thing that Spunky did say too. She said, I've been on Facebook forever, it's just not doing anything for me. Well, I would argue you're not, you're not on Facebook and you're not using it, and you're probably on the wrong network. Facebook's not for networking. Facebook's for your grandkids. That's why I have a Facebook page. So my, grand, so my parents can see my kids grow up. I'm not, I'm not linked to my parents on LinkedIn. I got this email from LinkedIn. They're geniuses. They're marketing geniuses, I tell you. I felt special for all about 10 seconds. They said, I am the top 5% most viewed profiles. And I was like, great, that's awesome. And then they did the math. What's 5% of 200 million? I'm one of 10 million lucky people that got this email. <laughs> but I dug a little further and, and I found out that 80% of the activity on LinkedIn is done by the top 5% of the people. That means there's 95% of the people on LinkedIn that could use it a whole lot more effectively. And there's a lot of people out there that have put up profiles, haven't completed them, and have never been back. And they're sitting back saying, man, why, why is the phone not ringing? I'm not getting anything out of this networking thing. I don't get it. Well, you've got to put the time in. You've got to go back. Get involved. Simon Sinek, write that name down, and go to YouTube and watch some videos. This guy blew me away and changed my world, changed my world view. He says, as soon as you begin to feel confident in your own abilities, you start to naturally help others. LinkedIn has a perfect, perfect setup for you to go out and spread your expertise and help others. And the title of this talk is Giver's Gain. And I, I believe that wholeheartedly. When you start giving yourself time and energy to other people, you're going to get that energy back. As long as you give it without expecting to get it. There's this thing on LinkedIn called groups. And I don't know if you'd noticed or not, the OCAA is not on there anywhere. Maybe it should be. It enables people of the same like-minded people, the same groups, to get on and talk about things that are important to them. Ask important questions. Look for jobs. RIA, what was RIA before it was RIA? No one knows what RIA was? Really? These guys would. ASCR, Association of Specialists in Cleaning and Restoration, they rebranded. This is what it looks like inside the RIA group. You can see up here you've got a discussion board, you've got list of members, you've got promotions, you've got jobs that members can go and post jobs that they have or post that they're looking for a job. I use it to stir the pot, frankly. I get, a, I get a question that I need an answer for, that I know is going to cause com commotion, and I find the group that I feel I'm going to get the most polarized views from, and I post a question and see what happens. And it's magical. I ask the question, should contractors start to wait to do repairs until they get paid from the mortgage company? Because I've been sick and tired of waiting six and seven and eight months to get paid because the mortgage company, you guys have done your job, you wrote the checks, but then they set up the mortgage company forever. But people wanted the job, people, the homeowners wanted their jobs done, so contractors have become banks. Anyway, it's a very contentious question, 
And it was amazing seeing the adjuster's point of view, the public adjuster's point of view, and the contractor's point of view on the same thing. And I learned more by asking questions on LinkedIn that I did in my last two years of college. Doing good for others inspires others to do good for you. The other feature of LinkedIn is recommendations for your skills and written recommendations. This is, uh, this is a profile for Mike Allen. Mike Allen has been recommended 30 times by people like me, I'm on the end there, for his skill in property damage. How many resumes have hiring managers looked at where they could see a living, breathing referral list right there? This is a built-in referral list. If someone has any question of, is this person good at this skill they said they're good at, well, they can start checking it out right here before they even pick up the phone. LinkedIn makes it super easy. Every time I go see someone's profile, it asks me, does Mike have these skills or expertise? And I can say yes or I can say no. This one I said yes. But then it says, okay, that was great. Anyone else in your network, did they, are they good at these things? Some of them are, some of them aren't. This is the point where I, I say don't blindly recommend anyone. Would you, would you give a blind recommendation to someone you didn't know? LinkedIn makes it dangerously easy to do that. I met this guy at a networking event, Evan. I talked to him for five minutes. I had his business card and I talked to him, so he belongs in my network. I know him. I don't know him real well, but I know him. Yesterday, or two days ago now, I get a recommendation from Evan for my leadership. How does he know what kind of leader I am after talking to me for five minutes? He doesn't. So there's a danger that my, my profile is being watered down by the fact that people don't care, they're just clicking a button. So this is, this is the whole follow your heart and bring your mind along too. Protect your profile. Protect your profile like you would your resume and your own professional background. Don't water it down just by clicking a button. The other thing you do with LinkedIn is you invite people to join your network. And LinkedIn plugs in these, this, this, this sentence, I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn, Andrew. If you get that and you don't know that person, don't accept the invitation. The, I sent this out, I'm guilty, but this is a person that I was like, eh, I, I know them sort of. I'm gonna see if they'll, they'll click, but I didn't really want them to be in my network really badly. If I want them to be in my network, you, you write a personal message, hey dude, it was awesome seeing you with this thing, why don't we hook up on LinkedIn and see what we can do for each other? Make it personal. I'm way over time, aren't I? Oh, we're gonna make it. Because we're on the last slide. Let's say you're sitting down at the table, hammering out a contract. You've been there all day and hammering out this contract. The person sitting across from you stands up and says, you know what? I agree to all your terms. I like this, I agree to all your terms, let's do business together. And you say, great, let's shake on it. And he said, no, 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 no. I agree to all your terms. I like it, let's do business together. And you say, great, let's shake on it. But he won't shake your hand. You're either not gonna do business with them, and if you do, you're gonna be very, very nervous about it. Why? Because this connection, making that personal connection, infers trust, and infers responsibility, it infers that this person, you've had that physical connection with that person, they're gonna do what they say. And no matter how much electronic doodads we have out there, no matter what comes back and replaces LinkedIn or replaces the computer, we're still gonna have each other to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And the connections that we make, that we hopefully have conversations with, that hopefully turn into the relationships that we can build on, they're not done via Twitter. They're not done via email. Real relationships and connections are made right here. There's a reason that we come to these conventions. 
The technology is there that we could do this. We could all be on a camera right now in front of our desk or on our couch eating popcorn and be at this convention together. But there's a reason we physically come. That's because we belong. We get more out of it. We get more interaction. And the end of the day, we get more relationship out of it. So no matter what you use, and I recommend you use LinkedIn, make it about that person. Make it about the people that you interact with. Make it about those relationships. If we can shake hands more often than picking up and sending an email, we're going to be better off. We're going to build lasting relationships. And I wanted to bring back number 10 on that list of my recommendations of LinkedIn, how to, how to use LinkedIn, is to hang up the phone. Don't do an email. Pick one of your contacts that you want to have a conversation with. Ask them out to lunch and go to lunch. Go have a coffee. Make it real. If we make it real, that's a relationship that's going to last. Questions? Whoa! Really? OCA will have a LinkedIn page. I'm going to make it happen. I'll talk them into it. Everyone here should be on LinkedIn. Everyone here should be part of the OCA LinkedIn page because we're all part of the same tribe. We've been, trying to, we've been forming tribes as people, uh, as human beings, since the beginning of time. Tribe is important because tribe is an extension of our families. And when the economy tanks and things change and they're turned upside down, all we have is each other. So let's connect. Thanks for your time.